Welcome to Making Money. This is Matt McCall. Thanks for joining me. We got another repeat guest coming up for you. A guy that's got knowledge like you would not believe. Mark Yusko is joining us today. Uh, we're going to dive into a lot of different topics, uh, get some heartfelt uh, views on what's going on in the world right now. Uh, everything from Mental Health Month uh, to cryptos to the banking crisis. Uh, this is a much needed uh, interview for many of us to hear uh, what's really going on behind the scenes. So. Hope you enjoy that. So coming up right now on Making Money, Mark Yusko. Most investors never touch this segment of the market, but according to the latest analysis from our team at Stansberry Research, this is the number one most important sector to pay attention to in 2023. And we're urging you, to move your money immediately. You can stay one step ahead of the market to potentially unlock extraordinary gains just by understanding why this sector is set to boom. I strongly encourage you to read our analysis totally free today. It's all spelled out in a free report we just put together. Get the facts yourself. Go to hiddensector2023.com to get your free copy of this report. You can learn how to profit from the untapped potential in this hidden sector before it becomes widely known. Again, that's hiddensector2023.com for a free copy of our new report. So I'd like to welcome back uh, for a second time, Mark Yeska. Mark, thanks so much for joining me. And um Getting you back on here, but before we jump in uh, to obviously all the stuff we're going to talk about from the Fed, uh, obviously Bitcoin, banking crisis, um, I want to wish you a belated uh, happy birthday. Uh, I won't tell the Thank world how old much. you are. You're but in, not, not very belated, you know, less than 24 hours. So I appreciate it. You're probably looking at a picture right now as, as uh, the audience is watching of uh, Mark uh, and tell us what you do on your birthday. I thought this was fascinating when I saw it on Twitter. So... Uh, and I, I don't know exactly when it was, but it was, you know, 25-ish years ago. Um, you know, I had a, a health something in my life, either a friend or family member. I don't remember the exact details. And, you know, I had that epiphany, right, that, look, health is wealth. Because without it, none of this other stuff we talk about matters. If you aren't healthy, if you don't feel good, if you're dealing with, you know, whether stress or ailments or, or physical uh, debilitation, life stinks. So um, yeah. I started to get a little healthier and, and do a little exercise and, and I committed, I don't even know where this came from, but I committed that every birthday I would uh, strive to achieve 120 minus my age push-ups. And someone asked me, you know, where'd that number come from? I said, well, when yeah. I was 20, doing 100 was possible. At 60, which I turned yesterday, 120 is not possible. What, what, what was possible? <laughs> it seemed like yeah, I could get to 60. And, and I did, barely, but I, I got there. Uh, and you know, someone said, well, when you're 80, you'll no way you'll be able to do 40. I'm like, oh, well, we'll see. Um, if you would have told me at, at 40 that I'd be doing 60 at 60, I would have laughed because I could barely do 25. Um, wow. when I started this, but anyway, so just, just a little silly thing, but, uh, we all got to have something to look forward to on our, on our anniversary of our birth. Right. That's great. That's great. That's congratulations. And I tell you, I know we're going to talk about a lot of other stuff, but that, that I like that you brought up health. Um, I don't know what my epiphany was either, but probably in the last 10 years, uh, I had one and, uh, I always was fairly healthy, but now I became, you know, very into my health. I go to a longevity clinic every 18 months, all these things. And, and, and you're right. And maybe it was when I started making more money, realizing that money isn't bringing that happiness. And right. it doesn't matter how much you have, if you're not here, you know, you got, you got to hang uh, around. Amen. And, you know, and, look, and, and we've all had that, right. We've all known people who, who died too young, uh, and you know, had everything, right. I mean, yeah. You know, and, and look, I mean, you know, we had the, the headline of, of Thomas Lee, famous private equity guy, you know, taking his own life. So even yeah. billionaire, probably even a multi-billionaire uh, struggle with demons and, yep. you know, lots of, you know, Steve Jobs, you know, just an incredible human and leader and builder gone to too soon with cancer. I mean, I'm, mm -hmm. I wear pink every Wednesday because I lost my best friend when he was 45, you know, far too wow. soon. Um, 
So yeah, if, if, if you don't have your health, you, you really don't matter. All that other stuff just doesn't matter. And I had this, this, uh, guy that I backed and, you know, I used to be in the business before I kind of became a venture cap, a late in life venture capitalist. I was in the business of allocating capital to other money managers around the world. And I said, I had the best job in the world. I got paid to talk to the smartest people in the world and give them money. It's awesome. Um, <laughs> and so there was this young guy, UNC grad had worked for this legendary investor up in New York who'd you know, been trained by Julian Robertson, Dwight Anderson. And um, long story short, he read a hundred biographies of all the great wow. investors. And he became a great investor by reading yeah. those biographies about these great investors. And he didn't know any of them, but he studied them. And I had a, not, not quite as in depth, but a similar experience. I used to write these very long letters and you know, my, my team and, and our PR people would say, Mark, why do you write these letters? You know, no one's going to read 40 pages. So I don't <laughs> care. It's not for them. It's for me. Because if I can't read what I wrote, how do I know what I think? So it's the process mm -hmm. of synthesizing into, into writing was for me. But what I did is, is I would take all the quotes of a great investor, Julian Robertson, George Soros, Lord Temple, or, uh, Sir, Sir John Templeton, uh, Seth Klarman, and I even did one on, on um, Alexander the Great. I did uh, you know, all, all kinds of different things. And I would take all their quotes, and then I would write about applying that quote to investing. And it was unbelievable. I mean, what I learned from that process, it was almost like sitting down with them because I'm, I'm engaging with the words that came out of their mouth over you know, many, many years. And uh, so, anyway, I'm not sure how I got That's on that topic. That's pretty fascinating, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, and just to, to piggyback what you're saying, read as much as you can. I mean, not talking to you, talking to people watching the show. Read is something that unfortunately I didn't get into until later in life. Yeah. Uh, but yep. it's changed my life since then. The, the education I've got from reading about history and other people. Um, I read a lot of books about the future. The one over my shoulder here, uh, Future is Fascinating Thing by Peter Diamandis, one of the greatest books I've ever read. Uh, futurist. Yep. I mean, he's writes very well. Um, so, yeah, I think you have to. It opens your mind uh, to, to a lot more than the little bubble you live in, too. And, and, and time. Oh, 100%. You know, the, you know, that, that, there's a great there. line, right? If you want to have new ideas, read old books. You know, Churchill's, the further back, for, farther back you look, the farther forward you can see. Um, and, you know, there's nothing new in this world, right? You want to know about great management, like, you know, all the self-help management, read Socrates, read Plato, read, you know, uh, Seneca the Younger. You know, I, I quote on my, my desk over there. Uh, from Seneca the Younger that I, I kind of look at, you know, every day success changes or failure changes for the better success for the worst. <laughs> every time you have a success, you actually get less good, which is totally yeah. counterintuitive. Every time you fail, <laughs> you get better because yeah. with every investment, we get richer or wiser, never both. Because when yeah. it goes well, you don't analyze it. You don't think about it. You don't try to figure out what you did right. When it goes wrong, you look at it. You analyze it. You learn from it. Yes. And and what separates the greats, like the truly great investors from the rest of us, is the greats have an uncanny ability to forget. They make more mistakes than others because they're not paralyzed by being wrong. And when they make a mistake, they do what, you know, the great coach, um, <laughs> I'm yeah. blanking on his name, um, Dean Smith, said, uh, you know, you have to route, yep. recognize it, admit it. That's the hard part for most people. Yeah. Learn from it and forget it. That's investments. I mean, I, uh, I've been doing this for 20 plus some years, you know, have it all looked at my legal department, how well I've done every year with my stock ideas and everything. And I'll tell you, I'll be honest with you, Mark, last year was one of my roughest years I've ever had. Uh, you know, I do a lot of small innovation growth companies. Some aren't profitable yet. They got crushed last year crushed unbelievable and people started people start questioning me what well, you know what is wrong what's going on i said shit i've been doing this for 25 years i'm gonna have a couple bad years i had about five amazing years in a row yeah and it happens and this year so far year to date we're doing great it's just like of course but it's, it's, it's amazing i had but it, it, it's tough because i had to make myself forget but i still but i also had to look at those losers and learn from them so i had to learn but but also i mean and and, and think about crypto 
how many individual investors say they own, they own Bitcoin, right, as their core, but bought a lot of small little coins throughout yeah. the last couple of years and lost everything. And they view sure. the crypto market based on that, not on the big picture, but on those little crappy coins they never should have bought, right? Look, it's, well, it's, but it's the nature of, of every market. Everybody's like, oh, crypto's different. It's full of scammers. I'm like, really? Do you know the term bucket shop? It exists for a reason, right? The boiler room. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Right? yeah. You know, small cap stock scams. Go back yeah. and, and look at history in the 1920s, in the roaring 20s. And look at all the scammers and all the you know little companies that had no real business that would go public and they'd pay off the officials and 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 then they'd just go out of business and and that's what eventually led to to the crash and and did we stop investing in stocks because there were a lot of scammers in you know the 1920s no how about in the 1970s when we had the savings and loan crisis and you know I guess it was 1980s. And a savings and loan crisis, and uh, you know, we stop investing in stocks. No, or how about the global financial crisis when the big banks, right, the banks that we trusted, were scamming us with CLOs and CDOs and and you know, slicing and dicing, you know, the big short. Nope, we didn't stop. Yep. And and yet, when people talk about crypto, they're like, oh yeah, you know, I had a bear market last year. Like yeah, and year to date <laughs> this year, it's up almost a hundred percent. And it is, again, for the 11th out of 14. It's only been in existence for 14 years. Bitcoin's only been an asset for 14 years. And 11 of those 14 years, it's been the number one performing asset. And over the whole 14 years, number one, by far. No, I mean, it's, yeah. not, it's not close. And, and it was, oh, it's not, it's not a real asset. It's not, it's not investable. Like, it's gone from nothing 14 years ago to half a trillion dollars. Okay. That's that's something. Half a trillion is, is something. Yeah. <laughs> and this idea that it's somehow going to go away is it's just silly, right? It's it's literally like saying, you know, that internet thing is just never going to be a big deal. Or yeah. you know, personal computers. <laughs> Steve Ballmer's mom, right? Honey, why would you work yeah. for that company? Yeah. No one would ever want a computer in their house. Well, why did she say that? Well, because the president of DEC, Digital Equipment Corp, that made big mainframe computers said no one ever want a computer in their house. They just want big computers in their in their buildings. Like, no, we want a computer in our house. We want a computer in our hand, right? Yeah. Pretty soon we want a computer in a little earpiece or hopefully not, I'm not putting a chip in, but someone might. Yeah. Um, but I I get it why it's hard. And look, it's even my pinned tweet, right? The greatest invest the greatest mm -hmm. wealth is created by investing in innovation. Okay. To invest in innovation, you have to invest in something that you believe in before others even understand. And you'll be mocked and ridiculed and criticized for your non-consensus action. It's totally worth it. You know, with everything you're talking about, um, I'll tell you before, some crises and things. And and we look at the banking crisis today and, and how that equates. Um, the last time we talked to you, it was prior banking crisis. So... Let's get caught up on, you know, obviously Bitcoin itself has held up very well during the banking crisis. If people start questioning yep. our financial system, which they should. What's, what, what is your view on this? And does this end soon? Is this bigger? And what are the long term implications for cryptos? Wow. Big question. So. This is not the end. This is not the beginning of the end. It may perhaps be the end of the beginning. Back to Churchill again. Um, the banking crisis, remember Yellen, like four or five years ago said, there'll never be another crisis in her lifetime. Mm -hmm. And then someone joked and they said, well, you know, she's almost, you know, expired anyway. Like, well, okay, that's not very nice, but okay. Um, but I mean, just clearly silly, right? I mean, it's cyclical and, you know, as, as sure as the sun sets and rises, there was going to be another financial crisis and, and. And we, we have one going on. And the more people say it's contained or it's over, mm -hmm. the more you know it's not, right? So, you know, first you had Yellen say it wasn't going to happen. And then it happened. Then you had Powell say, well, it's totally contained. And then two more banks failed. And then you had the president say, definitely, perfectly healthy. Everything's good. <laughs> nope. So, because what hasn't happened yet 
is the loans. So, so the first thing that happened is the banks had the crisis in mm-hmm. 09. And what happened? Fed lowered interest rates to zero and said, all right, we'll reliquify the banking system by lending you money. Okay. And you take that money. So we'll lend you money for zero. You take that money and you buy bonds, okay? Mm-hmm. government bonds. Okay. Now, why would they do that? Well, because it was a free arbitrage, right? If you borrow at zero and you get paid three, you can lever that up 10, 11, 12 times and you make a lot of money. And, mm-hmm. you know, for the last 15 years, that was a great strategy. Well, okay. So then what happened? As banks became more liquid, a whole bunch of banks like Silicon Valley Bank, Signature Bank, Silvergate, uh, suddenly started to take share away from the big dogs, aka Mm -hmm. JP Morgan. And there's a famous story, and again, history always rhymes. So in, in the 1900s, there was a law passed that allowed trust companies to happen. And it may have even been the 1890s, but but trust the Trust Act was created. And in the early 1900s, this thing called Knickerbocker Trust started to really surge in New York. Mm-hmm. And there's a famous quote that J.P. Morgan himself said, you know, I like a little competition. And he spread a rumor that Knickerbocker Trust was bust. And if you go to Wikipedia and you look at the picture of Bank Run, You'll see the picture of the Knickerbocker Trust and the you know people with their umbrellas and their top hats and you know running to the bank. That's a bank run. And Knickerbocker Trust went bust, and J.P. Morgan had to personally guarantee the banking system along with John D. Rockefeller. And then he magically got to buy, because of the 1907 Trust Act, these assets for pennies on the dollar, and so much for the competition. So. Again, what's happening now? Well, a bunch of these small banks that serve entrepreneurs and crypto suddenly get big, like big, right? Second, third largest banks and, you know, or fourth, fifth largest banks in the country. And so JP Morgan gets pissed off because now they're real competition. So what happens? Now, again, it wasn't J.P. Morgan this time, but somebody or some buddies spread a rumor that these banks were in trouble. And and unlike the old days where there had to physically be a run, like I had to get out of the office, go in my car, go to the bank, stand in line. Now you just push a button. Forty two billion dollars vanishes from Silicon Valley Bank on a Friday and they're bust. And on Sunday they get taken over. Okay. Then it happens with Signature Bank. Then it happens, um, oh no, Silvergate first, was first then Signature Bank and, and Silicon yeah. Valley Bank. Yeah. And like, oh, and then and, and then the last loan was First, first Republic. Republic. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, well, wait a second. Well, who bought First Republic? Oh, J.P. Morgan. <laughs> like I, I talked about this a week ago Friday on a podcast on the on the Friday, saying you know what's going to happen this weekend? J.P. Morgan is going to take over First Republic, and sure as shit, you know, wow. guess what happened? And, yep. and it's the way it always is. Remember Washington Mutual, right? That was the largest yep. banking collapse in history. They got taken over by J.P. Morgan. When Bear Stearns went under, J.P. Morgan. So why is that happening? Well, it's a consolidation of assets at the top. Why is that important? What are the implications for crypto? All right. So crypto is opt-out. Right? It's an opt-out mechanism. It allows you to opt out with a portion of your wealth from the fiat fiasco. What is the fiat fiasco? Well, following the Knickerbocker Trust debacle in 1907, John D. Rockefeller and, J- and J.P. Morgan concocted a scheme with their father, with John D. Rockefeller's father-in-law, Amory Aldrich, to launch the Federal Reserve. But what was the Federal Reserve? Okay, the Federal Reserve was a plan to create a federal, okay, not government, but a private corporation. This is the funny thing. The Federal Reserve is neither federal nor has any reserves. Right? It's not a government entity. It's not owned by the government. And it has no reserves. It's not a bank. 
It is literally a private corporation modeled after what? Modeled after the Bank of England, which is modeled after what? Modeled after the Netherlands National Bank, which was created by the Rothschilds in 1607. For what? To create money out of thin air, to finance wars. So we have this weird dynamic that the Fed exists to steal the wealth of the masses through this thing called inflation. Inflation is not good for us. So, so what happened? So all of the graft and corruption of the savings and loan crisis and, and the first banking crisis in the 90s and the second banking crisis, uh, gold financial crisis in 2000, 2009. So January 3rd, 2009, Bitcoin is born. Now, why was it born on that day? And why is the first image on the Bitcoin blockchain in the Genesis block a photograph of or JPEG of the Financial Times chancellor on the br brink of second bailout for banks? Well, that is, again, a commentary, a social commentary on why Bitcoin needed to be created. It needed to give us a way to take our fiat convert it into something that is no longer inflationary, can't be devalued because there's a finite supply, it's scarce. And that deflationary asset allows us to protect ourselves against this fiat fiasco, which means we can create fiat out of thin air. So fast forward to today, what are the implications? Well, the banks reliquified themselves then these other competitors rose up and they were threatening the guys at the top again. So what do they do? They foment fear and create a, a, a reverse bank run. So all the money flows back up to the, to the top banks. Why? Central bank digital currencies. Well, what's a central bank digital currency? Central bank digital currency is not Bitcoin. It's not Ethereum. A central bank digital currency is a closed, centralized ledger that is a surveillance tool and a control tool. So it's all the worst things about fiat money, in, inflation oriented, can be devalued by, by decree, plus programmability and control. I mean, it's a living nightmare and surveillance. And so there's this crazy video by Augustin Karstens. I used to call him Job of the Hut, and I realized that wasn't very polite. So he actually looks like Kingpin <laughs> from the Spider-Verse movie, yeah. uh, multiverse movie. I mean, he literally looks like Kingpin. I mean, the guy's 500 pounds if he's an ounce. I mean, he's a very large man. And he does this video. He's, he's the head of B, one, of, one of the guys at the BIS. I don't know if he's the head of it. And he says, well, of course, we should control how you use your money. Of course, we should be able to put an expiration date. Imagine that you get paid for working your ass off. And the money, if you don't spend it by Friday, it goes away. Are you kidding me? I can't save my money. Wow. I have to spend it. Well, why would they want to encourage that? Because consumption is what the, drives economic growth. It drives the money to the top of the pyramid. So yeah, here's the thing. Bitcoin has held up, as you said, really well, right? We got the second and third mm -hmm. largest bank collapses in history and Bitcoin's up. Now, if you would have told me six months ago that two of the largest banks in America are going to fail, what's going to happen to Bitcoin? Everybody, I mean, everybody would have said, oh, it'll be down 50%. It'll go to zero. Peter Schiff would have been saying, oh, it'll definitely be zero then. <laughs> okay, Peter, here's the thing. Over the last 10 years, gold is down. Gold is down yeah. and Bitcoin's up about uh, a hundred, uh, 10 years, it's like 850%. So gold is down and, and Bitcoin's up 850%. So, so something's, you know, broken in that, in that model, but the money keeps getting worse. And what crypto does, and particularly Bitcoin, um, and it's really Bitcoin, Ethereum, Monero Dash, and a handful of others, 
everything else, utility tokens, securities, mm -hmm. gambling, meme coins, like everybody's all psyched about Pepe or, or whatever. Yeah. Look, <laughs> you want to gamble on meme coins, knock yourself out. But it better be in the get rich bucket. Like everyone, I always say you should have three buckets. Liquidity bucket to fund your lifestyle. That's five to 15% high quality, you know, liquid assets. Then a get rich bucket, right? 10 to 15%. That's to do the brother-in-law's condo deal, the friend's venture deal, the meme coin. You're going to lose it all, so keep it small. But you want to mm -hmm. play the game, knock yourself out, right? It's like when people go to Vegas. Great. Yeah. Entertainment. If you happen to win, leave. But if you stay, you'll get it back, and that's fine. It's, it's entertainment. I mean, I, I play Magic the Gathering and with my son, and I spend money on those stupid cards, and <laughs> it's entertainment. So whatever. Yeah. But um, I watched Maverick for the 11th time last night, and uh, yeah, I like Great it. Great movie. I, I pay for that 11 times every day. Yeah. So <laughs> entertainment. But the, the, the core of your portfolio needs to be the stay rich bucket, and that needs to be the stuff that – you know, you, you can't afford to lose. So that's, that's where Bitcoin, Ethereum fit. Would you, would you put stocks in there too? Like S and P 500, would that be in that middle bucket? Okay. Absolutely. That'd be your equity yeah. portfolio. I mean, look, okay. The get rich bucket is equity of all types, common stock mm -hmm. equity, preferred equity, real estate equity, private equity, venture capital equity, energy equity, digital asset equity, anything that is, this. And equity is either an owner or a loaner. There's only two assets in the whole world, right? There's debt and there's equity. There's currencies and commodities that make the quadrant, but those are derivatives or, or, you know, or things that we denominate stocks and bonds in. But in this world, you're an owner or you're a loaner. And being a loaner is safer in the sense that you have less risk because loans are contractual claims. If I loan you money, you don't pay me back, I can sue you. It's a contractual claim. And that's why bonds have lower returns. You know, Risk-free is what you get for taking no risk and you get chewed up by inflation and you make no return. If you loan your money out, you get paid a risk premium for loaning it out, but it's a contractual claim. Equity is a contingent claim, meaning you only get paid back if the contractual claims get settled. So it has more value. It has a higher expected return. So if the long-term return on on risk-free is four, bonds is six, 2%, six, 2% above in uh, risk-free, and then equities is 11, 7% 7 above risk-free. Okay, that's great. Private, you get another 400 basis points for private equity, private real estate, private energy, private debt. And then uh, you can use leverage. That's just a tool uh, to enhance returns. But equity, everyone should own equity. But Mm -hmm. but not just blindly owning equity and not owning equity at any price, right? I don't understand how people are buying FANG stocks at these prices. I mean, these companies are growing low single digits if they're growing at all. Apple's not even growing anymore. They just manufacture growth through buying back stock. That's not real growth. Their actual revenue growth is, is not high. Income growth is not high. So I don't know why people pay growth stock multiples for companies that aren't growing, but there are lots of, of equities around the world that are really attractive. There's all kinds of good stuff in Europe, some good stuff in Japan, lots of good stuff in emerging markets. Um, but you want to pay for growth in equity. And then digital assets, you know, the ecosystem is so young and nascent and we're so early in the development that there are lots of ways to play the, the growth of the migration from, you know, we went from the analog world where I would give you a physical piece of paper money and you would give me a physical piece of paper, a stock certificate to the mm -hmm. electronic world where I give you ones and zeros on a ledger at the at Bank of America and you give me a QCIP from your brokerage account and that's how we trade stocks. Now they keep the physical piece of paper in DTCC, why I don't know, mm -hmm. I mean, we don't need them, but we do, yeah. um, to a digital world where a digital blockchain, a ledger, will keep all asset records permanently, immutably encrypted, fully secure. And, you know, you just think about the use cases for, let's take the Bitcoin blockchain, right? There's a whole thing now about, well, people are storing inscriptions 
physical items like the picture of you know the financial times mm. on the bitcoin blockchain well why are they doing that it's the most secure chain it's the most valuable chain and if you have a valuable asset right a valuable piece of art a valuable piece of real estate valuable whatever it is you want it to be in the safest place possible and so people are all mad the bitcoin maxis are all mad because now the cost of engaging with the chain are rising well you're yeah. not supposed to flip Okay, the most valuable asset. It's supposed to be the base yeah. layer, the settlement layer, like Fedwire. I don't interact with Fedwire every day. I use my Visa card, and once a month, I interact with the main chain. I settle up through my bank into Visa and pay the money. I don't mm -hmm. pay with money every day. I don't interact with Fedwire every day. I don't need to. So the same thing with the base layer of Bitcoin and Lightning and, and other layers on top of it. As the technology becomes ubiquitous and as we move away from COBOL and Fortran and mainframes and, and you know, this, the, the nonsense of these antiquated systems to blockchain ledgers that are ubiquitous, real-time, global, nation-stateless, borderless, superior, encrypted, all of this technology, it's just going to be ubiquitous. The same way that you and I aren't debating how... TCP IP works right now. We just use it and we can talk to each other in high definition. Although I, I really, yeah. now that I turn 60, I'd rather, rather be a little fuzzy, but. <laughs> well, a lot of great stuff. I mean, I think we, we talked about a lot of great stuff and I think everybody listening at home got a lot of, got into your head and it makes me be like, all right, I'll buy you a beer or a soda pop, whatever you drink one day and listen to you talk for another hour because you, I mean, a lot of great stuff. Look, and, and you know what? I, I need to come to Nicaragua. I went to Costa Rica for spring break uh, and okay. half because my wife wanted to go to the rainforest because that's where everyone was going. But half because I want to check it out. Because mm -hmm. I don't want to move. Like I really don't. But here's the thing. Like if they pass this restrict act, I might have to move. Right. Yeah. The Patriot Act. Horrible mm -hmm. act. Right. Took away lots of rights, you know, surveillance, all kinds of stuff, illegal search and seizure. But at least they called it the Patriot Act. So I could I <laughs> feel good about it. Right. Yeah. This one. Restrict the Bill of Rights. This is antithetical. Restrictions yeah. are antithetical to rights. And so the idea that that you could be arrested for having an app on your phone and jailed for 20 years with no due process, the way it's written, that is insane. I mean, that's, yeah. that is literally insane. I don't care what app it is. That's insane. I mean, that's Guantanamo Bay-esque, like, oh, rendition. I suspect, Matt, you're a bad guy. I don't have to prove it. I can take you to Guantanamo and... Maybe you get out someday. Wrong. Yeah. I don't want to live in that world. So look, I don't want to move. I don't want the black ass to show up and, and take me in. But I, I went to check out to see what Costa Rica is like. And you're going to Nicaragua. And a friend of mine's in Panama. He's like, come check pa Panama. I'm like, I don't know. Costa Rica was nice. It's a little not quite developed enough where I was, but I was in the rainforest, not San Jose. I've heard San Jose is really, really nice, but I haven't really spent much time. The airport was amazing. The airport was, yeah. it was quite good. I spent um, quite a bit of time in San Jose. They, they've actually a pretty good arts uh, district there. Um, I will tell you that the one difference, uh, Costa Rica is a little more Americanized, a little too Americanized for me, whereas Nicaragua, it. no. You know, I'm going to, try to watch the, the rest of the playoff games at a restaurant called Buffalo Wings, not Buffalo Wild Wings, which has the same color and same logo as Buffalo Wild Wings here in the United States. Looks exactly the same inside, but it obviously has nothing to do with the Buffalo Wild Wings. So you it. can still get away with that shit, you know? So Love it. It, it, it's, it is definitely more of a little Wild West down there. But uh, I will tell you, if you're ever in a neighborhood, knock on my door, you're always welcome to come on in. All right. Well, I appreciate it. Look, I, I enjoy the conversation. Look forward to doing it again. All right. Thanks a lot, Mark. Have a, have a good one. We'll talk soon. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansbury Research, its parent company, or affiliates.